but it presents a challenge. But Christ presented a challenge to the Jews. Joseph presented a challenge to his brethren. All through the scriptures, we have the Lord put challenges in front of his people to see if they are willing to look past what they think they know and come to the Lord and, and ask from him if this is something that they should pursue and to, to make it a matter of between them and the Lord and not between them and what's happened to be in their, their age or their time or their culture or their tradition. And that's going to be a challenging thing for all of us. And I, I don't think as members of the church, even that, that we're at all exempt from that. I think every people who've ever had a relationship with the Lord, the Lord will challenge them in that way. Nobody gets a free pass. Nobody gets this opportunity to just kind of ride and skate along. And, and thank goodness that God does that because he wants to, it's necessary for that to happen for him to develop a relationship with us. All right. Well, I think uh, maybe it's worth going to chapter two. I, there's so much more we could talk about, and and if we if we if we want to, we can stay on chapter one. If you have something else, Kim. Well, you know the conversation is kind of is kind of uh, I think weaving in and out of the first four chapters here. So yeah, we're skipping it. Um, fair enough. Spoiler alert. Fair enough. Yeah, I don't I don't know that we we necessarily maybe even need to try and and pick out any verses here. Um, and use those as as uh, springboards, but an observation that I think is interesting, just to kind of build on what we were talking about the last episode. You know, this idea of types and shadows. Um, the story is the same over and over and over again, right? The pattern's the same. You're fleeing from the wicked city. Um, actually, it starts before that, right? A, a, a prophet or a messenger comes to declare the word of God, the righteous and the wicked are separated. The righteous are taken away and saved and the wicked are destroyed. Uh, and, and presumably, right, the righteous make a journey to something like a promised land. And that's going to happen on an individual level, right? As you go through your own repentance, uh, the word of God might come to you and you will have to choose to forsake those parts of yourself that don't align um and then you you go through a rebirth right that part of you you allow it to be destroyed but what we get here on a collective level another way of looking at this is that this is like a type of the end of the world right um the day of the lord the israelites up to this point would have thought of the day of the lord uh, in terms of Moses and the deliverance that they got, right? It's this outpouring of miracles, uh, this manifestation of God's hand. And it's their it's their deliverance in Exodus. And this time around, the prophets come declaring the day of the Lord. But the irony and the reason that Isaiah calls this is, what's the word? Unwanted act, unknown act, something to that effect, unprecedented the day of the strange, Lord. Strange, I thought. I think. I think. I think. Strange is what it says in the. That's the word. King James. Yeah. Um. The irony is that it's being flipped on its head this time. It, the day of the Lord is occurring, but Israel, right? They're they're Egypt now, in this case, and yeah. so the destructions are going to be poured out on them. Yeah, and and we see that Laban um, Laban is a type of the Pharaoh, and Nephi makes that direct correlation. Yeah, yeah, Nephi it says is. it in, when when his when his brother's about to beat him up. Yeah, I wonder if we should look at that. I I I think what's interesting. Well, one of the things that interests me is that at some point the Lord says, "Okay, Lehi, get the heck out of Dodge," right? And he leaves everything. He doesn't take anything with him except for his family and provisions and tents, and he just goes. Um, one of the things that strikes me as interesting is that I don't know how long they're gone in the tent but it says he's traveled three days in the wilderness and then he pitches his tent for a while he builds an altar 
he gives names to things you know um there's some murmuring that goes on and and at this point only after my father dwelt in a tent which feels like a little bit of a in addition to being the, the most one of the easiest scriptures for a young ironic priesthood holder to memorize is a nice like tight like okay we're living in a tent three days journey from jerusalem give or take uh and nephi only then does nephi say hey you know i want to know what's going on and so he cries unto the lord and the lord visits him and that's and softens his heart um so that he believes everything which his lord which his father has says said i think that's really interesting that you know nephi it it if Lehi doesn't have the faith to just go out into the wilderness, if he tries to stay, um, not only does he bring cursings upon himself, but I think he brings cursings upon his kids because I don't know if Nephi would ever have come to the conclusion that he needed to find out. You know, yeah. I, I suspect it was the fact that he was all of a sudden living in a tent without any of his stuff. Uh, in unaccustomed circumstances that makes him think, boy, I really need to know the answer. And then he's able to speak to Sam. Um, I don't know if you guys think there's anything there, but I think that's a something to think about. Yeah, I do. I, I think the fact that he says the Lord softened his heart could potentially indicate that he, he was kind of disturbed by what he was experiencing, you know, mm. as anyone would be. You, you, here you have your father now now granted imagine there's a really great article up on the interpreter foundation website that talks about um the deuteronomist reforms and speculating that perhaps lehi and Lemu or layman and lemuel were deuteronomists in the sense that they were old enough to kind of have been uh brought up and indoctrinated through josiah's reforms remember this was 25 years prior that these things began to take place and and the very specific things about not suffering sacrifices away from Jerusalem, like there's no more dreams and visions and angels and things like that. And this is what their father's doing. And he's saying, we're going to leave Jerusalem. We're going, I mean, their father sounded like an apostate. Like it, it sounds yeah. what he was saying was crazy, non-doctrinal against everything that they have been taught. And uh, to, I mean, to their credit, they honor their father and mother by by following their father into the wilderness, but this had to be a very difficult contradiction. And I, I, I have to think that some of that was at least going through Nephi's, um, Nephi's mind at this time, because he cries out to the Lord. It, the interesting thing about the, the word cry and you, I'll throw in the 1828 dictionary, go look up what it means in the 1828 dictionary. It's a loud shout. Like when someone cries to the Lord later on in Alma, he says, cry unto him for this, cry unto him that. He's, he's saying, exclaim with a loud voice with, with all that you have to the Lord. I mean, how often do we do that as members of the church? We're, we're very kind of, I think we've inherited this quiet Protestant kind of attitude with God, but but in the scriptures, we see this, this loud outpouring. So he's crying out to God and he's he's uh experiencing something very difficult and the lord softens his heart and and he goes okay i, I believe that's his first interaction the lord doesn't say anything to him he just softens his heart and says hey it's it's okay right and he recognizes yeah. that from the lord that's the first key right there can you go to the lord and can the lord at least soften your heart because i think sometimes we want all the answers we're like god like my daughter was asking me, she's asking the right questions. You have the right questions sometimes. Those are fair questions to ask, but the the answers may not be, the Lord cannot give them to you right now. You're not ready for them, but at least Lord, can you speak peace to my soul? Can you help me feel okay about, and, and the lectures on faith teaches us, lecture six says that we have to have a an actual knowledge that the course we're pursuing in life is agreeable to the will of God. And if you have that, that will enable you to essentially withstand all the persecutions, go through all of the, the horrific things, the, uh, the losing of your homes, the losing of life, all of those things. If you have a knowledge, an actual knowledge that the course you're pursuing is agreeable to his will, you can do all things through, through your faith. That's the foundation. That's the beginning. And this is what Nephi starts out with. He knows that their course is, 
is agreeable to God's will at this point. And this is what gives him the strength to go on. So I think all of us, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, you can come and read this. And if, if you don't feel like you're at Nephi's level of being way up here where we typically think of him, we could at least identify here. We could at least have this. The Lord can speak peace to our, our hearts. And we, that, that may not sound like a lot to maybe the average person, but when the Lord himself speaks peace to your heart and you know it's from the Lord, that makes all the difference. Yeah. I, I yeah. Two things that stuck out to me quickly, and then I'll, I'll get out of the way here for a minute. But yeah. you cannot overemphasize to people that Laman and Lemuel do not think they are bad. They do not think they're bad guys. They do not think they're rebels. They do not. They do not think they're unbelievers. They think they are correct and that their mm -hmm. dad and their brother are apostates. Just to be clear, if you don't catch that, you'll miss everything Nephi is trying to teach you by giving you all of what they say. They think they are the righteous ones. Don't you got to remember yeah. that. And the by other piece, the standards of the day, they would be because they're following everything that the hierarchy and the leadership had told them at the time, right? Lehi is the one that's kind of going off track here. They're saying that the people in Jerusalem are righteous. They're saying that everything is fine. All is well in Zion, so to speak, right? And yeah. yeah, they don't, they think they're being dragged out into the wilderness on some crazy apostate thing. And, and they're accusing their father of not following the law and, and not doing these things. And so they're not, yeah, they're not wicked bad guys that are, they're, they're conflicting with Nephi, but it's interesting to see them on these two sides of the issue where you have this family divided and they both think they're right. Like you said, it's yeah. an interesting dynamic. So where would we fall on that? How would we know which side is correct? I mean, we're hearing it through the protagonist side, right? But really, how would we know? A great point. And I, I can't remember my other point. So Cam, let's, sorry. Go I was ahead. just going to say, I, I wonder just how similar, maybe by an outward appearance, Nephi and Laman would have appeared before uh before the lord softens nephi's heart before nephi goes to the lord right to have mm -hmm. soften um i mean brought up in the same in the same home in the same culture uh i don't know i, I wonder if they had more similarities than differences until kind of that crucial point where nephi's heart is softened right and he begins this journey um of increasing in and a personal connection with the Lord. Can, can I point out that he does exactly what his dad did in verse 18 of first Nephi two? Laman and Lemuel would not hearken unto my words and being grieved because of the hardness mm -hmm. of their hearts. I cried unto the Lord for them. What did Lehi do at the very beginning? Mm -hmm. And then the Lord comes to him and he says the same thing essentially to him that I think we can deduce that he said to Lehi, even though we don't have the words. Blessed art thou because of thy faith, for thou hast sought me diligently with lowliness of heart. And inasmuch as ye shall keep my commandments, ye shall prosper and be led to a land of promise. Inasmuch as thy brethren, though, which shall rebel against thee, they shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. And if you keep my commandments, you'll be made a ruler and a teacher over them. And if they are going to rebel against me, I will curse them with a sore curse. And, the, and, and so basically, he says, look, I get it. I'm glad you care. And the way that you can help your brothers is to try to figure out how to help them not to rebel. Mm. You and know, there's an there's... interesting warning oh, ahead, woven into this here. Um, not to totally shift. Maybe we can come back, Steve, if you had something that, that wasn't in this vein. Um, there's an interesting warning here, though, that the Lord gives where he says, even, even though you're righteous and you're on the right track here um or you're blessed rather that your seed are still subject to the same they're still governed on the same laws that that you are and that your people are nephi found himself on the outskirts right um yeah. to the point that we're making that the majority had drifted into corruption and apostasy and these are supposed to be the lord's people right this is the irony the strange act that the lord's performing uh sort of against his own people and so the lord tells nephi that 
Laman's Laman and Lemuel's children, right? The Lamanites will act as a scourge to his posterity if they rebel against him, right? Uh, you're continuing in the right course. That's great. If you rebel against me, though, their seed will be a scourge against yours to stir them up in, rep in remembrance and repentance. And that's this is a common pattern we see, by the way, throughout uh, the book of Isaiah, for instance, where God, you know, we read that he uses his right hand and his left hand, and these mean different things. You know, the right hand is, is often um, identified with a righteous servant, a point to which the righteous gather, an ensign to which the righteous gather. And the left hand is used as a tool to chasten and to purify and to bring to repentance the Lord's people. Like Isaiah's uh, so, king of Assyria. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. Let, the let Lamanites me... perform the exact same function in the Book of Mormon. Okay, yeah. So so to these these points here, the you had said earlier on when towards the beginning, we we're talking about suffering and sacrifice in behalf of others. So we do see a pattern here. We see a pattern where there's this deep concern, and as soon as that concern goes internal to external, then we see some miraculous things happen right? It's almost like that's a principle of faith. There's this, this intercession. And we see this happen with Enos as well, right? As soon as he's forgiven of his sins, immediately he starts thinking of the Lamanites. His, his, his mind and his heart immediately go outside of himself. And then promises and covenants are made. And they're the same promises and covenants that were made to previous generations and to the fathers. And um, so I think that is a, a principle and, and principles are usually conveyed via patterns. And we see a pattern here. We see something happen and then boom, here we see something else happen, right? And there, there's another pattern that is occurring about right here. And it's in what the Lord is telling him. He tells Nephi that there's a land of promise that I have prepared for you. There's a new land of promise. See, that the, the previous land of promise, all generations past, was, was Israel, right? Now there's an, another land of promise. And he says, um, he says concerning his brethren that he's going to be made a ruler and a teacher over them. He is, he is being promised, in a sense, kingship over his brothers now if you were a a young israelite like this and you understood the scriptures and as the youngest child in the family you're being told you're going to be made a ruler over your rebellious brethren where would your mind probably immediately go joseph joseph in egypt right so what happened with joseph in egypt what were the things that characterized joseph in egypt he was able to interpret dreams right? He went through a lot of suffering at the hands of his brothers, but he was eventually lifted up at the end. And he was made the savior of his own family of the 12 tribes of Israel. And we will see that there are essentially seven tribes that come out of Lehi's seed. And these seven tribes, they're mentioned throughout the scriptures, all these different individuals. So we're seeing history repeat. Now, what I want to point out here is we're going to see Nephi consistently identify with other scriptural heroes now remember i told the story of of baal and how he was this this other god that people would identify with and we see the same thing happening today when we go out and watch these action movies and we were like all oh, these stories are more fun well nephi instead of going after these other tales he invests deeply in several different old testament um heroes or examples and the first of which I believe is Joseph right here. Later on, we're going to see him see himself as like a Moses. We're going to see himself, he's going to see himself as a David. And there's a very interesting and powerful way that, that this is done. Uh, Daniel, uh, Noah, even Solomon as a temple builder. Uh, Noah is like a ship builder, for example. We see him bringing things in there. Also as Isaiah, as a man who has apocalyptic visions, um, foretelling the destruction and and seeing the the salvation of his people at the, the end times. 
and then potentially as as Samuel. And and we can make all of these connections by the word links and the way Nephi describes these stories. And so what he does is whenever he encounters a problem, he immediately will will either verbally identify with this Old Testament hero or by his actions, his direct actions will do it something very similar to what they did to solve a similar problem in, in their age. And I think the lesson to us is that the more we know the scriptures, the more we're going to be empowered because if the Lord did it for them, then he will do it for us today because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Nephi specifically makes this point and demonstrates it multiple times. And so this was something only very recently I just became aware of. I was having a conversation with one of my daughters and I was pointing out several. And then I decided to go see if there were more. And lo and behold, I found more. There's at least seven to nine uh, very fairly solid examples that you can find in Nephi's story. But this is kind of where it begins. He's told that he's by this language, the impl and there's there's a reason why the Lord would say these specific things to him. The Lord is it works by patterns, right? And so he's when he's saying the youngest is going to be the ruler over the brethren, he's telling uh, Nephi what's coming, what's going to be expected of him. And Nephi gets it and he's on board and he jumps into it and he starts taking on that role. But it's not a one in one parallel. His situation is different. He encounters different things, but he leans on the strength of the relationship between that figure and the Lord. And that's what he mimics. He strengthens his own relationship with the Lord, and he's delivered through his own unique version of that, his own unique circumstance. So we too in our day can go, well, look what Nephi uh, did and what God did for Nephi and how he stood by him. I'm going through a hard time right now. I may be feeling some pressure from here. I'm dealing with an impossible circumstance. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take Nephi and I'm going to be Nephi and I'm going to make that covenant with God, and I'm going to let God fulfill his promises to me just like he did for Nephi. I think that's what Nephi is trying to demonstrate to us as possible. He's going back and doing that with his ancient scriptural heroes. He's embodying that, and he's saying, okay, now you go and take it from here. And I think this is the catalyst. This is where it begins. I love that. There's this point that's made in the lectures on faith, which is because... God's attributes are such that he's no respecter of persons, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, um, and that he works according to, to pattern. That if you are exercising faith upon the same principles and in the same circumstances that these other, say, scriptural heroes did, that you can have faith that the Lord will deliver you in the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny what you're saying is is almost a little bit meta because it's like Nephi is it's like a pattern of patterns, you know. Yeah. Uh, Nephi as a as a precedent or a pattern is saying, hey, a good idea is going to the scriptures and let's let's like create sort of this amalgamation of all of these righteous servants and bring them into one in ourselves, you know. And that's exactly what Christ does. So love that. Yeah, and like Josh was saying, he said this at the beginning, you know, Nephi's writing this decades after these events all occur. So he's retroactively looking back and and assessing everything that's happened to him. And perhaps even he's seeing some of these things for the first time and piecing them together and saying, okay, I now see, like I maybe I didn't totally understand at the time, but I see now and, and I'm going to try to write it in a way that others can can see it. Yeah. Right. So that they can have that power and that help uh, to go through the things that they're going to need to go through. So Nephi, Nephi expresses that whole intercession in his whole life. Everything he does is for the sake of his people and his posterity, you know, present and future. And, and we see the types of things that happen to him and he doesn't have it easy. And I think that's another important thing. He, even though he's super righteous, the Lord lets him get beat up by his brothers. The Lord lets him get tied up and left for dead. The Lord lets him get you know tied to the mast of a ship in front of his children while they cry, his wife and children cry, and and he's sitting there, 
sore in the, you know, and that would, it must've been horrible to go through that for those, those days, you know, and, um, he experiences all kinds of, of things. And we even has a, a Psalm, you know, where he's crying out about his, his sins and his, uh, uh, the temptations that easily beset him. Like he, he easily falls into these traps and things, um, and that he suffered so much, but he's that he then flips it and and talks about the Lord and he knows in whom he has trusted and all these great things. And, and it, well, anyway, we'll get to that. We won't spoil that anymore. Keep jumping ahead. But, but that's the, the thing about Nephi and many of these other scriptures is there are these beautiful golden threads woven through vast amounts of text, just content and narrative and they all tie in together. We we really get so many different stories being told simultaneously. It's really um, it's really amazing. You know, on that note, maybe we can jump ahead. I know you've written a little bit about uh, Nephi and Laban and that whole ordeal, and maybe how that um, is paralleled to David and Goliath. Maybe we can jump in there. You could share some of your thoughts. I know. I had originally invited Rob Kay to come on because he has sort of an interesting perspective to offer on this as well. Um, mm. You know, from a, from a, from a Jewish perspective. Um, That'd be fascinating. Yeah. I'll, maybe I'll, I'll do my best to kind of give a, a brief overview. So this can at least be a, a way to start thinking about this and then you can go and, and uh, absolutely yeah. listening, you know, we, we can, we can find his blog and maybe I'll put the link in the description. Um, but it's something like the, the record that they're trying to obtain is symbolically, it's the word of God, right? Mm -hmm. um, what he would call the record of heaven. So what is being demonstrated is a pattern for obtaining the Holy Ghost on an individual scale. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I'll just leave it at that. And uh, and unless you have any thoughts, we can we can jump into some of what you've written and some insights that you have on that. Okay. Uh, we've, we've been going for a while. Uh, I can, I can try to shorten it up as much as possible. Now that said, I would love to hear his perspective on it, especially somebody that actually has a Jewish background that can speak Hebrew, and understand it and, and, and see some of those things in the text. Um, you know, I, I am not a scholar. I'm just a regular guy. I just love the book of Mormon and I like to share the things that I happen to find. There's nothing particularly spectacular or I don't have any background or any qualifications to, to really uh, show things. I've learned a lot from other people and I've learned a lot of things just in my own personal observations. But, um, uh, and what I say is not the be all end all. There's many, many different ways of, of looking at this. And, and what I'll share is just, um, my particular way of looking at it based on what I have, uh, what I've learned over the years uh, in my own studies and, and from other people as well. But what we have is, is Lehi or Nephi goes back to, um, uh, you know, his brethren, there, there's a lot that happens in between um, Nephi actually going to Laban and their, their kind of journey to get there and what happens in between. And so, some of the significant things that I'd like to point out is that first, when they go back, uh, they go, they're very faithful. They know they're on the Lord's errand. Um, Laman goes to Laban first, and he just simply asks him for the plates after visiting. And uh, Laban has a very uh, violent reaction to this. He points at Laman and says, you know, you're a robber and I will slay thee. That's significant because we we learn through the, the text that Laban is a military man. He can command 50, right? So he's a member of the military. Now, uh, the one thing I do know about uh, the Hebrew understanding of the difference between a thief and a robber is, um, do you know that distinction? The distinction between a thief and a robber? No. You describe it. So a thief is somebody who comes in and secretly steals. So like somebody will sneak into your tent and they'll grab like your treasured pot and they'll run off with it or they'll they'll go into your herd of sheep and they'll sneak out with a sheep during the middle of the night and have a little barbecue well uh in my understanding is people who do those types of things are dealt with 
by like a, a community jury and there there have to be witnesses involved in everything and if they're convicted they have to make restitution and um there are uh, you, you've heard of like an, an eye for an eye and things like that i think it's called uh lex um talianus or, or something like i hope i'm saying it right but you have to make restitution for what you've stolen and there are a lot there are rules within the law that if you know if you steal a sheep maybe you have to uh, return uh, an extra sheep or uh, if you do some type of damage you have to make proper restitution for it and, but you, you weren't just like killed for doing that you didn't you didn't get like your your hands and feet chopped off or whatever uh, you were allowed to make restitution if you stole something because a lot of times people stole things because they needed them they were hungry they were starving they they needed something and they went about it the wrong way and they were allowed to um to, to make it right now a robber also takes but they do it by force and violence and they will either be gangs of people or an individual. It's robbery if you have a weapon and you threaten somebody to then take directly from them like that. And those people, robbers, were dealt with by the military. They were considered like a threat and they were killed by the military, right? So very different distinction. So Laban says, thou art a robber and I will slay thee because he had the authority to slay robbers if he was part of the military, right? And so, and I imagine some people are out there noticing little things I'm missing here and there, but this is just my general overall understanding. So when he says thou art a robber, he makes a false accusation against uh, Laman. Now in the scriptures, uh, Deuteronomy 19, 18 um, says that uh, the judges shall inquire uh, diligently. And if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. So shall you purge the evil from your midst. So if I come and I accuse you of robbery, that would earn the death penalty. If I falsely accuse you of that, then the punishment for my false accusation is what I was, is what would have happened to you if that accusation would have been through. And so that was a way that they deterred false accusations among the people. Like if you're going to make an accusation, you had better have evidence and proof because if you're lying and you're trying to bring evil upon someone, then that mirror comes right back at you. So by him saying thou art a robber and accusing him that way, that puts Laban, Laman up for the death penalty under the law. So number one, Laban just committed an act against the law of Moses that would have earned him the death penalty, right? Then um, we see the, they come back and they go, hey, I, I got kicked out. This happened. And Nephi says, well, let's get our treasure together and let's go give it to him and see if he'll make an exchange. Well, Laban lusts after it. Then he takes it. He robs them by force. <laughs> then he becomes a robber, which he would have been guilty of death at that point. And then he sends his uh, his servants out to slay them. So that's attempted murder, right? So there's another strike against him. He's just hitting up all these different strikes. So I, I think there's at least three things that he did where he broke the law. Now, here's what's kind of interesting is Nephi comes back and he finds, I know I'm skipping over some things. One thing I don't want to skip over is the fact that an angel um, comes and reinforces the, the message that, uh, that was given to Nephi personally by the Lord. An angel of the Lord came and there's, this is another slight little thing that I think is kind of cool. It says, a lot of times we think an angel of the Lord appeared, right? Like uh, in a flash of light and this glowing man was there. But a lot of the angels in the Old Testament, the word angel means agent or messenger. And a lot of times angels in the Old Testament, they're mistaken for mortal people. They just look like normal people. And Nephi later on says, hey, you guys have seen an angel. And Laman and Lemuel don't seem to acknowledge that. And we're like, wow, well, if you would have seen this glowing person in the sky, wouldn't that be evidence enough to you? Well, it doesn't have to say that this guy is glowing and in the sky. It says, behold, an angel of the Lord came and stood before them. It doesn't say the angel appeared. He just, he just came and stood before them. Now they're beating Nephi and Sam. They're in the desert. They're in the cavity of a rock. So you imagine they're in the cavity of the rock. There's a cave. And this man just walks around the corner and says, hey, why are you beating your brother with a rod? I mean, it, it doesn't say one way or the other, but it could have been that way. 
Yeah, and sort of left Daniel, maybe ambiguous on purpose. Yeah, and it says after the angel spoken to us, it didn't say he vanished. It says he departed. <laughs> he just walked away. He left, right? We don't know how he departed in what manner he did, but he came and stood before them and then he departs and he gives this message. And in my mind, what I see in my mind personally is I, I see a man just stepping around the corner or maybe coming up behind them. They, they don't really know where he came from and he's saying these things. But he says, know you not that the Lord hath chosen him, Nephi, to be a ruler over you. So here this man is telling Laman and Lemuel now that the Lord has chosen him to be a ruler over you. So this whole, this whole paradigm of Joseph Nephi knows it. Now Laman and Lemuel know it. Now they know that Nephi is going to think he's Joseph and try to usurp their birthright and everything. You know, so we have these, these are the things that are at play. Um, but then Nephi begins to, this is where he starts to drop the Moses uh, words, you know, let's be strong like Moses. Uh, he led the children of Israel out of Egypt and he will deliver us even as our father's and destroy Laban, even as the Egyptians. So right now he's seeing Laban almost like as a representation of the Egyptians, right? And so this is how he's going in. He's going back into Jerusalem, like Moses going to Pharaoh. And perhaps in his mind, he's thinking, I'm going to have this encounter. You know, he's led before he was led by the spirit. He didn't know what he was going to do, but if he's seeing himself as Moses, he's probably thinking of a, of a Moses Pharaoh type encounter at this point. Again, speculation, but seeing as how these scriptural stories are going through his head, we know a little bit of the story already, but I'm trying to take this as like, if this happened right here, I mean, nothing else, what would I be thinking if I was Nephi and everything I had at this point? So he's probably thinking he's going to go and and confront him. And perhaps maybe there's going to be some plagues. Maybe there's going to be some, some miraculous repetition and, and repetition of these events. And then boom, Laban's on the ground, drunk, <laughs> right? dressed in armor and Nephi just comes upon him and he's like, he, he kind of crouches down. He's, he's looking at him and he's like, okay. Um, let me get to my notes here. Um, oops. A couple of things I don't want to miss. All right. So he goes down, he looks at him and he sees a sword and he pulls it out and he's examining the sword He's looking at the workmanship of it. He's a little bit distracted by this a minute, you know, for some reason. And then the spirit constrains him to kill him. And he, he says in his heart, you know, well, I've never shed the blood of a man before. And he, he shrinks back, you know, he's, he's like, no, I can't do this. Well, listen what the spirit says to him. Behold, the Lord hath delivered him into thy hands. That phrase right there. And then the spirit says it again, slay him for the Lord hath delivered him into thy hands. And again, if you're Nephi and you know the scriptures, which it's clear Nephi does because he's quoting these stories and everything. And he sees a man dressed in armor laying before him on the ground. I believe at this point in his mind, he immediately starts thinking of a different scriptural hero. And that's David. Because David says to Goliath, um, he says, uh, the Lord has delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the, the paw of the bear, and he will deliver me out of the hand of, of the, the Philistine, right? And he says to Goliath right in front of him, this day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee. And what happens? You know, he, he throws the, the stone hits Goliath, he falls to the ground and, um, and then, uh, basically David cuts off Goliath's head with his own sword. And so at the same time, Nephi does the same thing after the spirit emphasizes this delivering, he's delivered him into your hands. He's delivered him into your hands. I think Nephi makes the connections and realizes okay, I, I need to not follow. I thought I was going to be following the Moses story. I'm following the David story instead. And he's already been told he's going to be made a ruler. And David was a young man who slew an impossible force at the time and later on becomes king and ruler over the people. 
And so Nephi acts accordingly and kills Goliath in the ex or, or Laban in the exact same way that David kills Goliath. And I think that's significant. And, and the other thing here is people go, well, what, you know, how is it that Nephi could kill someone? Does that mean any of us can just kill someone like that at any given time? Again, what we discussed a little earlier is it's already been been kind of established, I think, that the um the hierarchy of Jerusalem, the political and religious hierarchy were corrupt. So there would have been no justice. We've already seen uh, that we, we kind of skipped over this a little bit, um, but, or no, we're not to it yet. Actually, uh, Nephi sees later that Laban was actually um, out that night among the elders of the Jews. So he's buddying up with the elders of the Jews and is, and this is, it's kind of like the whole Epstein thing going on. We got all these people hanging out with Epstein and, and they're all like, I wasn't doing anything bad, you know, <laughs> it's like, and, you know, there's the whole guilt by association thing. But I think in some of the cases there and some of the cases in this particular case, there was corruption, right? There was corruption happening everywhere. And it's very possible that um, they would have not seen justice in Jerusalem for what Laban did to them because of his connections and the corruption and everything like that. And number two, Nephi is being set up as a new king and a new kingdom in a new promised land. And Laban is now under the jurisdiction of that new king because the current government is corrupt. It's disconnected from God. And now the current leader of this new nation is going to execute the law over this person who has been violating everything. And Laban himself comes to exemplify the fall of Jerusalem and everything that's about going about to occur to them. And it's being done right here in the most visceral way possible, just like the whole process of repentance of your sins was carried out by, you know, slitting the throat of, of a, of a lamb and, and offering those sacrifices in Jerusalem. It was a visceral experience to, for repentance to happen. And they, they were all familiar with this. And here is another visceral experience uh, about what's going to happen to Jerusalem as a whole. And that there's a transition happening in in leadership at this point, or there's a, a branch being carried out and that certain things have to happen in order for this new kingdom to flourish. And Laban is sitting there who is defying the law on the record that he's keeping in his treasury to keep it away from a new righteous branch that must have that law in order for that new kingdom to, to be established and for God to establish that righteous branch. And so, um, anyway, th those are some of the ways that I, that I kind of perceive that story and what's happening here. And it's, it's a story of, of Nephi's growth and, and the Lord positioning him, him for his own will, but it's also a reflection of the Lord's opinion of Jerusalem and his people at that time. And, and what will happen when we violate God's law, there's a, a bigger story being told here. It's not just one man killing another drunken man in an alley. It's a reflection of a much bigger pattern as hard as it is to read this story and deal with the implications like right at the beginning we have this beheading of a guy you know but if that's all we see we're we're missing everything else there there are much bigger things at play here and we can't take the book of mormon lightly we have to dive deep into these things and and really see what's being communicated and uh, i hope in some a little way that can that can add to to some of that understanding love that yes Steve, i i just was going to say that um i have a bunch of things i could riff on there but without doing that let me just say um the critics of the book of mormon what what they don't do a very good job of mostly is paying attention to the details uh, they're very surface level by and large there are some ex some you know an easy example is well view of the hebrews is the same because it's about the lost 10 tribes you're like well the lost 10 tribes let's go through that why are they lost well because they were destroyed by assyria that was a separate kingdom had nothing to do with jerusalem um this is not the lost 10 tribes in fact it's one specific tribe um and it didn't come from the destruction of Jerusalem, or I mean, it's destruction of uh, of the Northern Kingdom. 
Uh, and it, it really almost has nothing to do with the sort of legend or story of the of the lost 10 tribes, for example. And I loved what you did there because I just thought you provided so many details that were super useful and interesting uh, and a good examples of what happens when you sort of just take the Book of Mormon at its word and and look at it seriously. And all of the things you find that, as you nibbly said, it's not, it's not that the test of the Book of Mormon isn't whether you can find something that you don't think makes sense. History will always have something in it that you don't think makes sense. The test is how did you get so many things right? Um, and and so, yeah, I agree. I I wholeheartedly agree with that. Yeah, and, and I I would like to have, and I, I know that all of us, I think, in in our hearts, we we have we have some charity for the critics, right? And um, I can understand why people, obviously, if you don't accept the big picture of the Book of Mormon, because, because it always goes back to Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith said he got the plates in this manner. He translated them. It's, it's a, it's a difficult thing to wrestle with, right? It's an unusual story. It's, it's something that, that challenges you. And so if you don't accept that, you're obviously not going to delve into the, the little, the details of this. You don't get to that point because you can't get past that, that one big hurdle, but it's kind of like the, and I know I'm skipping ahead a little bit, the metaphor of the Liahona the Liahona rewarded the faith that, that those who handled it gave it right. And the book of Mormon also rewards the faith of those who approach it in a faithful manner. And that's a, that can be a challenging thing to do, especially if, if um, the Latter-day Saint tradition is not your tradition, you're coming from the outside and you're looking at that, but it presents a challenge, but Christ presented a challenge to the Jews Joseph presented a challenge to his brethren. All through the scriptures, we have the Lord put challenges in front of his people to see if they are willing to look past what they think they know and come to the Lord and, and ask from him if this is something that they should pursue and to, to make it a matter of between them and the Lord and not between them and what's happened to be in their their age or their time or their culture or their tradition and that's going to be a challenging thing for all of us and i i don't think as members of the church even that that we're at all exempt from that i think every people who've ever had a relationship with the lord the lord will challenge them in that way nobody gets a free pass nobody gets this opportunity to just kind of ride and skate along and and thank goodness that God does that because he wants to, it's necessary for that to happen for him to develop a relationship with us. But it, it can, it can be a very big challenge. And I have, um, I do have a lot of uh, just charity for people that, that do struggle or maybe even very antagonistic against the Book of Mormon. And I can understand why they would be. Um, I, I, I get it in a lot of different ways. And so I think all we can do is is uh, if we have a personal witness of this record is is to continue sharing our personal witness. I love the depth that we can go into here. And hopefully someone will hear this and and give it a chance and just and just see where it goes. And if it is of God, then what a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing to have more of God's word. And will that present some challenges to you in your life? Yes, it, it does for all of us in one way or another. But those challenges are good because they they develop they deepen the relationship um, between us and God. Sacrifice, intercession, those things you mentioned uh, at the beginning, Cameron, they all come into play. Thanks, Steve. Um, as we're wrapping up here, maybe just a couple other thoughts that I'd add to bring this full circle. You know, applying patterns to our days. Uh, seeing the scriptures particularly the book of mormon as an invitation to uh, read ourselves in maybe as layman and lemuel right maybe as the people to whom the warnings come the the very scenario that's being laid out first nephi here is that those who had been stewards of the covenant of the law had become unrighteous stewards unfaithful stewards 
the sword of Laban is really interesting because it becomes the symbol throughout the Book of Mormon uh, for the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Because it's had by Laban who possesses the Word of God at the beginning. Yeah. And, mm. you know, it serves as maybe a, a symbol of protection, right? You, there are these covenant blessings that are associated with having that. But the, the catch is that if you're not faithful to that covenant, you incur curses, right? The sword of Laban, I mean, it, he, he fell by his own sword. We read a similar thing in 1 Nephi 22. It talks about, uh, you know, the, the wicked Gentiles, the church of the devil being drunken, you know, sort of with the wine of Babylon. And ultimately they fall on and they're slain by their own swords. Yeah. Um, we get some language, you know, that that's a more specific warning to the Gentiles and specifically even the covenant Gentiles in third Nephi. Uh, it uses the, it uses the phrase cut off, right? That there are people that if they don't repent, when the word of the Lord to repent comes to them, that they'll be cut off from among the Lord's people who are of the covenant. Um, I don't think any of that is by accident or coincidence. Uh, the, the sword of Laban gets buried with the gold plates, with the Book of Mormon. Uh, Joseph Smith never used it that I know of. Um, I could speculate as to why it might have been buried or why those other items might have been buried with the plates. But we know at least symbolically, I think, I think what's being presented to us is, hey, the same things that applied to them apply to you. This is for your blessing, but it can be for your cursing. This is for your glory, but it can be for your condemnation. So the Book of Mormon is an invitation to yeah. repent, apply it, and uh, not incur the curses. Excellent insight. I, I mean, you're right on point there because the sword of Laban was possessed by all of the kings of the Nephites. King Benjamin even wielded the sword in defense of his brethren. And it, it may be that it was a symbol of kingship and the authority of government. And Laban could have represented that, you know, that government authority. And by Nephi, uh, and that, that sword cuts both ways, right? Laban was using the sword incorrectly, so it now cut back. It took off his own head. Now it's being used to lift up and preserve. And Nephi made other swords after the same pattern of that sword right so now that sword exchanged hands it went into the hands of a new leader who used it righteously and it became you know a symbol moving forward now, there's a lot of other really cool uh, connotations that come out of the future but yeah that so there's the there's the sword of truth that that cuts but there's also the sword of destruction that hangs over the people and so we see that being used a lot in the the hebrew word for covenant is bereath it means to cut um, specifically like the dividing of an animal into two and walking between the pieces. And when we see God in the creation, the whole creation process is division. He divides the light from the darkness. He divides the day from night. He divides the animals from the sea and the earth. He divides man from woman. He divides and then joins them back. So he, uh, the word cleave also means to, to separate, but also to join together. And so we see the Red Sea parting, Moses walking through it. We break the sacrament bread. There's, there's all of these times we see cutting happening. When we see cutting happening, we see covenants being waived. Captain Moroni, he rends his coat and writes the words of a covenant upon it, and everyone throws their coats down and rends them as well. So we, those those patterns are prolific throughout all the scriptures. So yeah, uh, totally agree with you there. What are you, Josh? What are you thinking? You look like you got deep in thought over there. I think the big greatest, maybe the greatest theme in the Book of Mormon is what do you do when you're faced with what seems to be an implacable enemy? How do you live righteously? Um, how do you uh, escape the influences uh, that are sort of inevitable hmm. in any society that are sort of the secret combination type influences? I mean, all of those themes are here, and some of them are previewed a lot more tightly than we think they are in first nephi mm -hmm. 
uh, one through four, one through five. So anyway, I think that's probably good. Cam, I don't know if whatever else you want to conclude with. Um, I don't know that I have anything to add. One of the major themes that I'm seeing here is uh, take it as an invitation to repent. Take it as an invitation that perhaps you're not already doing what the protagonist is doing, but this is an opportunity to evaluate. And uh, if you want to come to know the Lord better, if that's your highest desire, then this will read like a manual to do that. So. I love it. Steve, any last thoughts? Yeah, I... I do think that the problem in our culture is in, isn't that this is originating from us. It's that we're allowing it to saturate us, you know? And, yeah. um, and I, and I understand that I, it, it's a part of my life too. It's a part of my thinking. And it's just a matter of looking at what Nephi is showing us here. The more we commune with heaven, the more we're influenced by the culture of heaven and the culture that we happen to be immersed in. We can immerse ourselves in another culture, a higher culture. And that, that will make us sometimes seem like really weird, extreme, even apostate, uh, you know, people as we, we go through life and we have to be willing to go, okay, am I willing to walk that walk? Cause everyone's like, oh, I'll follow Jesus. What would Jesus do? We all want to follow Jesus by being nice to people and, and giving them cookies. But are you willing to be put in front of your religious leader and have them spit in your face and, and slap you and, and beat you up? all night? Are you willing to be put in front of the government and allow them to unjustly punish you and physically harm you for something that you didn't do? Are you willing to stand in front of your own people and have them choose a murderer over you? Are you, know, are you willing to go up to that hill and carry your cross and, and die knowing you're going to die, death sentence? Are you willing to follow Jesus and all of that? And that's really the, the challenge that Christ gives us. And what, what all of these people who follow him, we see the attributes of Christ being carried out in their own unique circumstances. And hopefully what we learn from that is we can write our own scripture, just like Nephi did. We can tell our own story and we can, um, we can apply the same principles. And perhaps some, someday, years and years from now, someone will read our own accounts and and if we and if we never do that, there's a there's a quote by Terrell Givens. He says we, um, when we write something down, we record something, put it in a journal. We rescue the sacred from the vacuum of oblivion. And so mm-hmm. I think telling our own stories and writing those and living in a way that we have something inspiring to record can also be a powerful uh, tool for us to utilize and another way that we can learn from Nephi's example here. Thanks, guys. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for jumping on, sharing your insights. Super appreciate it. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing the rest of you in the next episode.